This is the second Sunday of the month, and we'll be taking steps 3, 4, and 5. This is Mike, Alcoholic. Welcome to Beginner's Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous Group. We are recreating the beginner's classes from the early 1940s and 50s when the sobriety rate was an average of 75%. In Cleveland, it was as high as 93%. We take the 12 steps every month. On the first Sunday of the month, we take steps 1 and 2. Second Sunday, steps 3, 4, and 5. Third Sunday, 6 through 10. And on the fourth Sunday, we take steps 11 and 12. We take the 12 steps at the group level as an overview. For those who want to take the 12 steps on a one-to-one -one basis, please connect with a sharing partner. A sharing partner is a person who has taken all 12 steps, recovered from alcoholism, has had a spiritual awakening, and is willing to work with the newcomer. Will the sharing partners who want to work with others please raise your hand? Thank you. For the people that want to take the 12 steps, please connect with a sharing partner after the meeting ends. We have big books for sale at group cost of $8. Each page and paragraph is numbered. Please do not write in a book. This is the AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. Here's a quote from our co-founder, Bill Wilson, written in the 1958 A Grapevine. Sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps, is the sole purpose of an AA group. End quote. For those who want their paper signed, please hang on to them until after the meeting is over. We will sign them after the meeting is over, after we had said the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes this meeting goes over one hour. If you have to leave it at 7.30, do not expect to have your court paper signed. Or if you have to leave before 7.30, again, do not expect to have your court paper signed. We sign the papers after the meeting is over, after we had said the Lord's Prayer. This is done as a courtesy. It's not mandatory that we sign your paper. Please silence your cell phones. Please no texting during the meeting or talking. Let's take a moment of silence to invite the God of our own understanding into our hearts and remind ourselves why we are here tonight followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. We'll be passing the basket now for the seventh tradition. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. Thank you. For those who can get on the Internet, we do have resources online for these workshops. We have a MP3 format, file format, and PDFs for the handouts. They are posted on the website 
spiritualsteps.com. Again, spiritualsteps.com. We have the workshop for Paul Fisher, Brian and Catherine, and Ken B. And again, spiritualsteps.com. For those who want to go to YouTube, we have a YouTube site dedicated to Alcoholics Anonymous. Simply Google AA100011 and that will take you directly to the YouTube channel where currently there's over 19,000 subscribers and over 370 videos. A to Z pertaining to Alcoholics Anonymous and recovery from alcoholism. And again, that YouTube channel, simply Google AA100011 and it will take you directly to that YouTube channel. Thank you. Before we start the steps tonight, we have a 20-minute talk briefly describing the back-to-basic format as it was done back in the 1940s. Our special guest today, I am really honored that he is able and willing to join us. Wally P. is the author of Back to Basics, the Alcoholics Anonymous Beginners Meetings, and also... How to Listen to God, Overcoming Addiction Through the Practice of Two-Way Prayer. Wally P. is the originator of the Back to Basics Beginners Meetings, which have grown to thousands of groups across the country and in other countries as well. Wally P. has himself taken over 10,000 people through the 12 steps. Wally himself, and has witnessed countless miracles of recovery. Wally P., welcome and thank you for joining us on the Dr. Carroll Program today. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to join you and uh, your listeners. I want to say, first of all, that I, with you, am grateful that God has brought you health. I know you had some health challenges. You're doing well. You're traveling again. And I'm really excited about that for you and also for the people that you're able to share this, this good news with. Um, Wally, I know many people, and I'm sure many of our listeners, have heard about the 12-step programs, and many people have, have found a lot of benefits there, but there have also been some that have found that maybe the way they've experienced the 12 steps hasn't been completely successful. What do you think are some of the uh, things about the way the 12-step programs are usually practiced that, well, may not really be as helpful as they should be? Well, in the early days of the uh, 12-step movement, uh, the steps uh, weren't an option. They were a necessity. Uh, this is what a newcomer did. In fact, in many uh, areas of the country, you could not go to a regular meeting until you had actually completed all 12 steps. And uh, back then, they handed out uh, what was called a sobriety card, and uh, it had two dates on it, the date that uh, you entered the 12-step community and the date you finished the steps, and, and typically that was done within a matter of a few weeks. Today we have um, two schools, um, and, uh, and one is the fellowship of recovery, and the other is the program of recovery. And in terms of the fellowship, uh, many people here don't drink and go to meetings, 90 meetings in 90 days and uh, things like that, uh, which are actually contrary to uh, what was actually practiced in the early days, which was, oh, and another one was meeting makers make it. Well, in the early days, uh, it wasn't meeting makers who made it. It was step takers who make it. And, and that's what we're seeing is that people that are uh, getting reconnected with the steps, uh, getting reconnected with the original program are, are seeing the same success that they saw back in the 1940s and 1950s. And I'm, I've just been blessed to uh, be a part of this movement. Uh, just wanted to uh, say as an aside that I make no money from the sale of any book uh, or literature that has my name on it. 
This is my 12-step work for which I cannot be paid. This is my gift to the recovery community, and what an honor it is to be able to give this away. Oh, thank you, Wally, for saying that and for sharing with us today. I want to let our listeners know that we have some links on our website, some articles that you have made available, and also links to the Back to Basics book that, that you have authored. Wally, talk about some of the parts of or what's different about the Back to Basics approach to the 12 steps that you have found has made the difference for people. I don't think it's a question of difference. It's a question of of reconnecting with what worked, uh, what uh, Bill W. and Dr. Bob and the pioneers put together uh, as a very simple and straightforward approach uh, to the steps. Uh, the big book was written uh, with the assumption that the steps would be taken in a matter of a few hours, and uh, and that's the way it was practiced in the early days. Uh, I am uh, again, blessed to thank you for commenting with good health, and I'm back on the road uh, uh, taking people through the steps. Uh, I, I do it um, uh, on weekends uh, during a, uh, a day. We start at 9 o'clock in the morning on step one, and by 4.30 in the afternoon we've taken all 12 steps, including uh, a fifth step. We have a two-hour lunch break for to take the fifth step, and then other groups are doing um, – a one-week version where you take uh, session one on Monday, session two on Tuesday, you do a fifth step on Wednesday, uh, session three on Thursday, and session four on Friday. And there's uh, over 6,000 groups now, uh, each meeting each week, uh, which are taking the steps in four one-hour sessions over the course of a month, uh, such as every Wednesday night. Uh, last Monday I was in Lake Oswego, Oregon, and that was I was at there beginners meeting. Uh, Wednesday, I was at the beginners meeting in Anacortes, Washington. Uh, next Wednesday, I'm going to be at the beginners meeting, or one of the several beginners meetings in Vancouver, British Columbia. And then Thursday, uh, we're going over to Vancouver Island and, and see the beginners, witness the beginners meetings there. Wow, that that is awesome. Now, Wally, you talk about taking people through these steps in a matter of hours or at most a, a few weeks. That seems so revolutionary to people that may have been in recovery programs or 12-step programs for years and, oh, maybe now I'm on step five or working on step seven. It's, it's a very different approach. What, is there any benefit to doing the 12 steps repeatedly? I, I can imagine if you do it all in, in a day or, or in a few weeks, there may still be other things that you have to, to learn to grow into. Um, I'm, let me give you a quote from Bill W., co-founder of the first of the 12-step programs, and uh, and he made this statement in 1951, speaking from the podium in Hollywood, California. And this is a quote: "Don't make a project out of working the steps. Go through your day being the sort of person you'd like to be, trying to help someone else, and making sure you don't hurt anyone." And when you get to the end of your day, review the 12 steps, and you'll find that you have worked all of them. So the co-founder of the first of the 12-step programs was giving us the uh, statement uh, that uh, we're to take all 12 steps each and every day. And uh, and I do that. I, I do a surrender uh, each morning. I share with others throughout the day. I make amends quickly if I've harmed anyone. I forgive uh, people who may have harmed me. And uh, I, again, as part of my morning uh, quiet time, I listen to the indwelling spirit, and I write guidance, and I follow it to the best of my ability during the day and review it at night. And try to help somebody else, uh, at least at least one or two uh, each and every day. Um, and uh, when people would ask in the early days, what step are you on, uh, the answer was all of them. I think that is a very I, wonderful approach. This becomes a way that you live every day. And as that, that quote that you read, not getting bogged down at, at any one particular point. Well, it, you mentioned something that I want to to hopefully have you elaborate on a little bit, and that's, you mentioned surrender. I know that is a word that's regularly talked about. Another word is powerless in the, in the first three steps. Um, I know also that some people I have been aware of 
who are in 12-step programs or, or trying to overcome an addiction will say, oh, I'm just praying and asking God to take care of this for me. Talk about how relying on God or surrender to God and, and that thought, uh, how do you connect that with the need to take action and, and do something on your part? How, how do you work all that out? Well, the surrender is is essential, uh, and that is really the the heart and soul of the uh, beginning of the journey or the beginning of each day is to acknowledge that we can't do this alone. Uh, this is a we program. Uh, we read the big book together, we take the steps together, and we recover together. So part of that we program includes the God of our understanding, um, some people call it uh, spirit or the indwelling spirit. Uh, many, many different names uh, for this power, greater than human power, that resides inside each and every one of us. So that's the key is that it is an inner journey. It's a journey uh, to determine uh, which course to take each and every day by by listening and and receiving uh, guidance and we typically take action on guidance that passes uh, the test of forgiveness and and faith or love and uh, unselfishness and honesty and uh, and and hopefully we don't take action on anything that we receive that um, has to do with resentment or fear or selfishness or dishonesty. So we have a test to separate um, what the pioneers called uh, self-will from God's will. And I use a little 2012 version of it uh, when I'm taking people through the work, especially in large groups. Uh, I talk about the voice of addiction versus the voice of recovery, and can you tell the difference between the two voices? Well, the pioneers gave us a test to separate those two voices, and uh, and hopefully uh, we're able to learn from this. Uh, that's why we have sharing partners, because we may think it passes the test, and uh, our sharing partners or sponsors or spiritual guides uh, uh, may think otherwise, and, and it's a topic that we open up for discussion. We do have a caller, Wally. Would you be oh. would you be willing to to talk to one of our callers for a moment? Oh, absolutely. I had a question for you, Wally. It all sounds, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you're going back to the sort of back to the basics, right? Or back to the the, the founders' intents for the program. And uh, I, I agree that a lot of things have happened over the years. What particularly interests me is the fact that you have been discussing going through the steps in such rapid fashion. I agree that can sometimes drag on unnecessarily and people hem and haw. But my uh, question re revolves around the action steps, four, five, eight, and nine, and how you achieve that or, you know, how do you do those in such a quick manner and do them thoroughly enough that, that they're so critical to do completely. Uh, I'm sure you understand what I mean. How do you address that so quickly? Oh, excellent question, Jason. Um, let me talk about the uh, that uh, particular part of the program in terms of a concept that's relatively new. It's not a concept uh, uh, from the uh, 40s or 50s, but one that I particularly uh, enjoy in terms of visualization is that uh, uh, we peel the onion. That's why we take the steps again and again and again and again. And the and the key is to uh, get through uh, that process in one sitting. Uh, the sponsor and the newcomer sit down together, and the sponsor asks the questions, and the newcomer does the talking, and the sponsor uh, actually writes the four-step. I know this, this sounds like heresy to some people today, but <laughs> this is the way it was done. And uh, as an archivist historian for the 12-step community and, and having – and open access to every archival collection in the United States and Canada and interviewing more than 200, 300 people uh, that got sober in the 1940s. I am passing on their message and not mine, um, that it was done in one sitting. And then uh, you talk about it, and then you come up with an amends list, and then you role-play the amends. 
And uh, and part of the amends was uh, the concept that the uh, sponsor was the first person the newcomer saw after an amends was made, uh, either in person or over the telephone. And uh, um, but the whole uh, process of doing this in one sitting is part of the uh, way of looking at the steps as a continuum rather than as twelve distinct. And, and separate entities, uh, a continuum Wally, of process. Wally, I, I'm sorry we are running a little close to our break. Are you able to perhaps hold on for a few minutes? I love this discussion, and if you're able, Certainly. maybe we could just have you hold on for a few minutes after our break? I would be honored. Our very special guest today, Wally P., is the author of Back to Basics, the Alcoholics Anonymous Beginners Meetings, and also... How to Listen to God, Overcoming Addiction Through the Practice of Two-Way Prayer. Wally has taken over 10,000 people through the 12 steps of recovery over very short periods of time. And we've been talking with Wally about the back-to-basics approach. And Jason, calling while uh, driving his truck through Kentucky, was asking Wally about the action steps, uh, the four particular action steps in the 12-step programs. And taking those very, very quickly. And I, I think, Wally, you gave a very good very good synopsis of answering that. You need to at least get a certain level through those action steps quickly, even though you may have to come back and do more later. A- a- am I right there? Oh, yes. And let me clarify uh, for Jason and the uh, rest of the listeners that um, back to basics, uh, we describe it, in terms of the tourniquet, and uh, I found it ironic that today is the, uh, uh, on this date, the Band-Aid was invented. Uh, that's another <laughs> way of looking at uh, at these beginners' meetings uh, and, the, and the back-to-basics approach. And the example would be uh, a hospital. If you go to the hospital and, you're, and you have a knife wound uh, and you're ble- bleeding profusely, uh, the doctor doesn't hand you a book and send you home and tell you to read it. He puts on, he or she puts on the tourniquet and then moves on to the next emergency patient. And then another person will come along and, and, uh, suture up the wound and, and possibly a third person come along and, and put on uh, the bandage and uh, give you a shot of antibiotics and send you home. Back to basics is just the tourniquet. This is just to keep you alive long enough so that you can take the steps in more depth and detail again and again and again and again and get deeper into those layers of the onion. If you don't put the tourniquet on, you're not going to be alive long enough to take the steps in more depth and detail. Does that help, Jason? Yes, that's a great answer. Thank you, Wally. Um, as you said, there's there's a whole lot. I've heard that expression myself in the rooms a number of times, of course, and it's a very good uh analogy for the process of, of undoing uh, so many years of, uh, of having lived with this illness and all the destructive events that have happened in your life. So uh, that's um, I appreciate the time today. Thank you for having me on, and uh, it was great to talk to you both. And thank you, Wally. Wally, another question that I, I hope you can address. In your book, How to Hear from God, the, the two-way prayer, and I know yeah. you've alluded to that a couple times. Just briefly share what that whole practice is about. Uh, this practice uh, has been around for centuries and centuries. It, it's not unique to uh, the 12-step community, um, though our 11th step makes it crystal clear as to what we are to do in terms of action. It says, uh, sought through prayer and meditation. Prayer is talking to God, talking to the indwelling spirit, uh, typically in prayer, uh, but the second half of it is listening for the answers. It's um, it, it's a two-way communication because uh, as a result of becoming a listener, and that's what many of the pioneers consider the steps all about, steps one through ten were to remove the blocks that prevent us from becoming effective listeners. Step 11 teaches us how to listen. And step 12, we let God do the talking as we work with others. So it it is about listening, and it is about being guided in terms of 
messages that we receive either through sight or sound or sensation or, uh, or knowing. Those are the four channels that, uh, that Bill described on page 14 of the big book, uh, sight, sound, sensation, and knowing. And then further on in the big book, it talks about an, uh, inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision is how, how the spirit will uh, talk to us through inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision. And we have to be careful with the decisions because it could be a, a yes or no, but keep in mind that weight is a decision. And, uh, and be careful right. with the fourth one. If you insist, uh, if you insist on taking your will back, uh, guess what? We get it back and then we're off to the races and, uh, uh, usually with very negative consequences. So, uh, it's a, it's a powerful tool. Uh, there are 11 step guidance meetings that have sprung up all over the country and around the world where people actually use this as a meeting format. Uh, it was a meeting format in the early days of the recovery movement. Uh, started in Dr. Bob's living room in the summer of 1935. Bill and Bob both practiced it on a daily basis. Um, and it, uh, again, uh, has become a lost piece of our history that's now being uh, rediscovered and, uh, and reemphasized. I want to let our listeners know that you have made some articles available that we have put links to on our website. I was really touched by one of them. You had a large number of quotes from people who have experienced the, the Back to Basics beginners meetings, some who were beginners, but some who continue to include that approach in their, in their daily life of, of, of living healthy and, and recovery. I have to say, I was I was rather touched by by some of those letters and and, and stories of people who have really uh, really found healing and, and recovery in this approach. I I imagine you hear that a lot, Wally. Oh, I, I am so blessed, Doctor Carroll, um, to uh, receive uh, all of this very, very positive feedback, uh, and not just from the people that I've taken through the steps personally, but the thousands of people that are conducting the meetings, and, and the more than 500,000 people that have been through the work, uh, and uh, also uh, how the work has been incorporated into other 12-step programs uh, other than the original uh, uh, basic recovery for food addiction and basic recovery for sex addiction. And the General Service Office in New York has asked us to reserve back to basics uh, for the first of the 12-step programs having to do with alcohol. It is uh, equally applicable to other addictions and other obsessive compulsive behaviors and uh, and I, I received the emails, I received the telephone calls. I just got a phone call earlier this week from a man who was returning to Russia. He uh, he started Back to Basics in St. Petersburg and had Back to Basics translated into Russian, and then he took it to Moscow, uh, came back to the United States uh, for a few months to basically unpack and repack, and, and now he's going back to Russia to plant more uh, beginners meetings in, in other uh, cities in Russia. And the book has been translated into Chinese and Japanese, Polish and Norwegian, German and Spanish. And uh, all of this is done for fun and for free. Uh, uh, no money ever changes hands. And uh, I get to witness the miracles because uh, uh, somehow or other they, uh, they find the, the time and a, and a phone number and give me a call. So just a, just an awesome to hear the, about their miracles. Well, Wally, I I, I want to say God bless you. Keep spreading the message. You know, you have really touched my heart, and and I know our listeners. I appreciate you taking some of your weekend time from your spending some time with your family to be with us today. We're really pleased and honored. And go with God. Oh. You too, and uh, as uh, Dr. Bob and Bill used to say, uh, keep it simple and pass it on. Keep it simple and pass it on. Thank you, Wally, and we'll have to stay in touch. Thank Bye-bye you, Dr. Now. Carol.
This is Mike, alcoholic. Tonight we'll cover steps three, four, and five. Let's go to page 59 and let's listen or read the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. 2. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 3. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, as we understood him. 4. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 5. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. 6. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. 7. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. 8. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Okay, let's start with step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Let's go to page 63, paragraph 3. Page 63, paragraph 3. We found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. But it is better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. The wording was, of course, quite optional so long as we expressed the idea, voicing it without reservation. This was only a beginning, though if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a very great one, was felt at once. Okay, in step three, we're going to make a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understand Him. Remember, in Wally's talk, he talked about the voice of addiction and the voice of recovery. In the big book, there's the distinction or test for self-will versus God's will. And I'm going to play that clip again just as a reminder to help in this decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand Him. Well, the surrender is is essential uh and that is really the the heart and soul of the uh beginning of the journey or the beginning of each day is to acknowledge that we can't do this alone uh, this is a we program 
Uh, we read the big book together, we take the steps together, and we recover together. So part of that we program includes the God of our understanding. Um, some people call it uh, spirit or the indwelling spirit. Uh, many, many different names uh, for this power. Greater than human power that resides inside each and every one of us. So that's the key is that it is an inner journey. It's a journey uh, to determine uh, which course to take each and every day by by listening and and receiving uh, guidance. And we typically take action on guidance that passes uh, the test of forgiveness and and faith or love and uh, unselfishness and honesty and uh, and and hopefully we don't take action on anything that we receive that um, has to do with resentment or fear or selfishness or dishonesty. So we have a test to separate um, what the pioneers called uh, self-will from God's will. And I use a little 2012 version of it uh, when I'm taking people through the work, especially in large groups. Uh, I talk about the voice of addiction versus the voice of recovery, and can you tell the difference between the two voices? Well, the pioneers gave us a test to separate those two voices, and uh, and hopefully uh, we're able to learn from this. Uh, that's why we have sharing partners, because we may think it passes the test, and uh, our sharing partners or sponsors or spiritual guides uh, uh, may think otherwise, and, and it's a topic that we open up for discussion. Okay, let's go to page 62, paragraph 3. Page 62, paragraph 3. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father, and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed, if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of His presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. Let's go to page 63, paragraph 2. Page 63, paragraph 2. We were now at step 3. Many of us said to our Maker, as we understood Him, God, I offer myself to Thee, to build with me, and to do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will always.
Okay, what we just read is what is called the third step prayer. For those who are ready to take the third step and make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand Him, we will repeat this prayer together. So everybody, please stand and we will say the third step prayer together. God, I offer myself to Thee, to build with me, and to do with me as Thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do Thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of Thy power, Thy love, and Thy way of life. May I do Thy will always. Okay, thank you. We have now completed step three. Let's move on to step four. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. In step four, we're going to inventory our life and remove the blocks that stop us from receiving the sunlight of the Spirit or the God inside us, this indwelling Spirit. So in the blocks that we have, that we have to inventory, the number one offender is resentment. It's anger remembered. The second inventory item is fear. We list our fears. And then the third inventory is the sexual conduct was it selfish or not? And then we have uh, the list of harms that we've done to other people. Let's look at some of the quotes out of the book concerning resentment, fears, and sexual conduct. Let's go to page 64, paragraph 3. Page 64. Paragraph 3, and it starts with, Resentment is the number one offender. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. We asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions? our personal or sex relations, which had been interfered with. Let's go to page 66, paragraph 1. Page 66, paragraph 1.
It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. Well, let's go to page 67, paragraph 2. Page 67, paragraph 2. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Let's go to page 66, paragraph 4. Page 66... Paragraph 4, and it's at the bottom of the page. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Let's go to page 68, paragraph 1, page 68. Paragraph 1. And it starts with, We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role He assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think He would have us and humbly rely on Him, 
does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let Him demonstrate through us what He can do. We ask Him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what He would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. We're going to move on to the sex inventory. So this is all about our sexual conduct or behavior. Let's go to page 69, paragraph 1. Page 69, paragraph 1. Go four lines up from that paragraph where it says, We want to stay out of this controversy. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and on our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. Okay, that is the inventory straight out of the big book for resentment, fears, and sexual conduct. If we have anything out there that needs to be addressed, for instance, any list 
of harms that we have done, please add it to your inventory. We want to be thorough. Before we move on to the fifth step, I thought maybe we could listen to Wally's talk again. I have a little two-minute clip that is important here at this point to uh, have right after the fourth and right before the fifth. I thought maybe this would be appropriate. My uh, question re revolves around the action steps, four, five, eight, and nine, and how you achieve that or... You know, how do you do those in such a quick manner and do them thoroughly enough that, that they're so critical to do completely? And I'm sure you understand what I mean. How do you address that so quickly? Oh, excellent question, Jason. Um, let me talk about the uh, that uh, particular part of the program in terms of a concept that's relatively new. It's not a concept uh, uh, from the uh, 40s or 50s, but one that I particularly uh, enjoy in terms of visualization is that uh, uh, we peel the onion. That's why we take the steps again and again and again and again. And the and the key is to uh, get through uh, that process in one sitting. Uh, the sponsor and the newcomer sit down together, and the sponsor asks the questions, and the newcomer does the talking, and the sponsor uh, actually writes the four-step. I know this this sounds like heresy to some people today, but <laughs> this is the way it was done. And uh, as an archivist historian for the 12-step community and, and having and open access to every archival collection in the United States and Canada and interviewing more than 200, 300 people uh, that got sober in the 1940s. I am passing on their message and not mine, um, that it was done in one sitting. And then uh, you talk about it, and then you come up with an amends list, and then you role-play the amends. And, uh, and part of the amends was uh, the concept that the uh, sponsor was the first person the newcomer saw after an amends was made, uh, either in person or over the telephone. And uh, um, But the whole uh, process of doing this in one sitting is part of the uh, way of looking at the steps as a continuum rather than as 12 distinct and, and separate entities. Okay, let's move on to step five. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Let's go to page 72, paragraph 1. Page 72, paragraph 1. Chapter 6. Into Action Having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our Creator, and to discover the obstacles in our path. We have admitted certain defects. We have ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We have put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. Now these are about to be cast out. This requires action on our part, which when completed will mean that we have admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step in the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. We think we have done well enough in admitting these things to ourselves. There is doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We will be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do so. The best reason first. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. 
Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory, all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves. But they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty, in the sense we find it necessary, until they told someone else all their life story. At the bottom of the same page, page seventy-three, paragraph four, the last line on the bottom, where it says we must entirely be honest with somebody. We must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world, rightly and naturally. We think well before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. Those of us belonging to a religious denomination which requires confession must, and of course, will want to go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by an established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. If we cannot, or would rather not do this, we search our acquaintance for a close-mouthed, understanding friend. Perhaps our doctor or psychologist will be the person. It may be one of our own family, but we cannot disclose anything to our wives or our parents which will hurt them and make them unhappy. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. Such parts of our story we tell to someone who will understand, yet be unaffected. The rule is: we must be hard on ourselves. But always considerate of others. Okay, let's go to page seventy-five, paragraph two. Page seventy-five, paragraph two. We pocket our pride and go to it. Illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. We thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know Him better. Taking this book down from our shelf. We turn to the page which contains the twelve steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. This concludes the session for steps three, four, and five. Thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me help you today. Next week we will cover steps six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Here I have a couple quotes out of the big book. I want to share some information describing a sharing partner. A sharing partner 
is an alcoholic who's recovered from alcoholism through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, has had a spiritual awakening, and is willing to help the new person through the 12 steps. Chapter 2. There is a solution. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. We are average Americans. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. The ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty, that he obviously knows what he is talking about, that his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he is a man with a real answer, that he has no attitude of holier than thou, nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful, that there are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. Chapter 7 Working with Others Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our twelfth suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Beginner's Big Book Group provides sharing partners for those who want to take the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Will the sharing partners who want to work with others please raise your hand? Thank you. I have one last quote from the Big Book. It comes from the chapter, A Vision for You. And then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you. Until then. In honor of our AA pioneers and the old tradition, we'll simply stand without holding hands and close this meeting with the Lord's Prayer. <laughs>